بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وأجل فرجهم So we left off last week talking about uh, Nabi Dawood alayhi <coughs> salam. We left off with an interesting uh, story. We'll recap with the, where we left off. We said that once when Nabi Dawood alayhi salam had finished reciting the Zabur, Allah sent a small frog to remind him to remain humble despite the beautiful voice of Dawood and the birds and the mountains would sing uh, praises with him. The frog asked Dawood, are you pleased with your ibadah or your worship today? He said that he was. Uh, the frog said, don't be too pleased. For each night I and my kind, the frog, they exalt, uh, we exalt Allah 1,000 times and each exaltation is followed by three praises. We do this from our, our uh, water, uh, watery abode, it says, like in the pond. Then when we hear the screech of a bird flying overhead, when we perceive hunger in his voice, we jump and we splay ourselves in full view of the bird so that it may eat us up. He hoped to show Dawood how his exaltations of Allah were fewer in number than theirs and required no great sacrifice the, ways that, the way that theirs did. You know, and we said that <clears throat> no matter how much that we feel we have done to worship Allah, uh, it will never amount to the praise that Allah deserves. We must never feel content in our actions that they are sufficient or to say that I am the best worshiper in my masjid. I am the best uh, worshiper in my city. I am the best, you know, Muslim and this and that. And we should never feel that our actions are enough that we have done enough, that we don't need to do any more. We should always feel the opposite, that, uh, you know, that we can always better ourselves and strive hard each day to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make each day better than the previous day. And we brought a narration from Imam Ali alayhi salam where he said, while describing the muttaqin, the pious ones, he said, they are, they are not satisfied with their meager, small, good acts, and they do not regard their major acts as great. They always blame themselves and are afraid of their deeds. When any one of them is spoken of highly, he says, I know myself better than others do, and my Lord knows me better than I know. O oh Allah, do not blame me for what they say, and make me better than what they think of me. And forgive me of those shortcomings which they don't know about. You are surely the knower of the things unseen and the cover of the defects. A beautiful narration in Sabata Shia by Sheikh Saduk. <clears throat> so this was one lesson that we get from this is to never be content with our acts of worship and that we can always do more. Another time Dawood was reciting uh, loudly. So uh, when he was done, he noticed a tiny red caterpillar crawling along that was next to him. So he watched it until it stopped in front of him. And he thought to himself, I wonder why Allah made such a creature like this. So Allah gave the caterpillar the ability to speak to Dawood, alayhi salam. It asked, uh, O Prophet, have you ever heard my movements or seen any sign of me uh, of my having passed your way? Have you ever noticed me before? Dawood said, no, I have, I have not. The caterpillar continued. He says, Allah Almighty hears my footsteps and my breaths and sees where I have passed. So lower your voice. So we get from this that not everything needs to be proclaimed loudly for it to be accounted for by Allah. Not everything has to be said Allah, uh, aloud. Allah knows our innermost thoughts. Imam Bakr, alayhi salam, he's talking about the good deeds. <clears throat> he said to preserve the good deed in your scroll of deeds is much more difficult than actually doing the good deed itself. Someone asked him to explain this. So the Imam gave an example. He said, when a person helps his relative, 
and gives money for the sake of Allah, who has no partner, it's recorded that he did so secretly for the sake of Allah. But if he mentions this good deed to someone else, he goes, oh, you know, talks to his friend and say, you know, I had to help out my my um, sister today and gave her some money or my brother to uh, my uncle or whoever. I gave him some money, you know, I just helped him out. Then it is mentioned that this good deed uh, will be reclassified in the deeds that he had done openly. And if he mentions it again to someone else, then it will be classified as a deed done for showing off to the people. So it can go from giving a good deed in, uh, secretly to end up becoming a deed that was done to show off. So we have to be careful to guard our deeds. And the Imam says it's harder to guard our deeds than actually to do the deed itself. And many people think that they, since they have, uh, because they have done something, that they need recognition for their work. You know, they, you know, in reality, the one who knows all things has recorded your action and you will be rewarded for that thing. And that's the most important thing in this. Seeking recognition from people, it doesn't amount to anything but causing someone to become proud and arrogant. There's a story when uh, one night an interview with a uh, young, he said a 16-year-old war veteran was shown on uh, Iranian television station. The, the interviewer asked, what is your occupation? He said, I detonated uh, landmines for, you know, 16 years. He said, how many mines have you uh, detonated so far? So the news reporter, you know, the interviewer on television, everyone's watching. He says, how many of those have you, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, mines have you um, removed? He said, by the grace of Allah, many of them. So he said, do you know exactly how many of them? He said, I'm afraid to say, lest shaitan inflict me with ujb self-admiration and arrogance and make my friends who have not detonated uh, a, you know, a smaller number of mines, maybe they feel belittled because I say I have done so many and maybe makes people feel like they have not done, you know, they feel less than me. I don't want to humiliate someone and I don't want to make myself seem proud. Also, it reminds me of, uh, you know, getting recognition from other people doesn't mean anything. I remember hearing a story about uh, Ayatollah Sayyid Sistani of Allah that when uh, he was doing a project and some other people uh, <clears throat> took the credit for that project that he was doing. And they came and they said, uh, okay, uh, Sayyid, these people have put their name on the project and they don't mention you at all. They don't say anything about you did the project and you helped the project and they claimed all the, you know, the recognition for this project. What should we do? I, they were upset. And he said, you know, it's okay. Don't worry about it. Allah knows who helped the project, you know. Uh, Allah knows who does good deeds. Let them take it and be responsible for it and it frees my time to do another project, you know. This is a good way of thinking. It's also mentioned, you know, um, that one of the other great uh, Maraja who passed away, he, uh, one of the guys came to him in his office from uh, Lebanon, and he said, oh, Sayyidina, you know, I'm old, I'm sick, I'm about to die, and uh, I need to ask you something. So the Sayyid, he, he said, uh, yeah, go ahead and tell me whatever it is you want. And the guy said, you know, I had done something against you and I ask your forgiveness for that. And he's like, what do you mean? He said, well, I have a, uh, there was a great book by you and I wanted people to benefit from this book. But due to the fact that uh, maybe some people were against you and uh, if they knew that you wrote that book, they wouldn't have read it. So I wrote my name on the book. And I got the credit for writing this great book when in reality, I didn't do anything. I only took your book and put my name on it. So say it called the person in the office who normally makes tea or does the errands or these type of things. And he asked the, the person, 
he, he whispered to him, says, you know, go over in my library and grab such and such book off such and such shelf and bring it to me. So the guy came and brought uh, the Sayyid the book. So the Sayyid, uh, Rahmatullah alayhi, he, he gave the book to uh, this guy and he told him, he said, you know, this I forgive you. Don't worry about it. Here is volume two of that book and print it in your name. It says it doesn't matter, you know, who gets the recognition for the work. The, the matter is, is that the work is getting done. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows who uh, is doing what and what we are doing. <clears throat> so this is a lesson we also get from this story that the caterpillar says, even Allah hears my footsteps and knows about me and even my breath. Such small thing as the breath of a caterpillar that we cannot even, uh, you know, fathom. Allah knows the breath of this. So he knows what we are thinking and what we are saying and what we are doing. He says the next part of this chapter, he says, during the 11th year of his rule, a plague descended on the people of Jerusalem. So he instructed them all to gather with him at the great rock where they used to worship. Dawood had witnessed a constant stream of angels rising and descending from this spot. So he knew it would be the best place for him to plead with Allah. So he stood on this great rock and begged Allah to relieve his people from this plague. So his dua was answered and the plague was lifted from them. So Dawood decided to make that rock a formal place of worship. And so he began construction of a sanctuary on that spot. He said that this sanctuary came to be known as the Holy of Holies. Uh, and millennia later, it would come to be known as the Dome of the Rock. So this place in Jerusalem, this event happened with uh, Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. He says, Allah consolidated Dawood's power, fortified his kingdom, and gave him wisdom and, and decisive judgment, but only after testing him. And sometimes we even see that prophets are tested. You know, sometimes we expect that since we are believers and that everything should come to us easy, it should be smooth. We should have no trials, no tribulations, but that is not the way it is. Don't we see that? Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam was tested. We see here that uh, Nabi Dawood is being tested. All of the prophets are facing tests and trials. So who do we think we are not to get any uh, test and that our life is supposed to be some sort of walk in the park? And it doesn't go like that. You know, Allah says in Surah an kabut ayat 2, do people think that they will be left alone after they're saying that we believe without being put to the test? So we will definitely... Uh, also, in uh, we'll definitely be put to test. Also, in Surah Baqarah, it says, Surely we will test you, we'll try you with something from fear and from hunger and from loss of wealth and these th th things. <clears throat> so, he says, To this end, Allah sent a group of angels in the guise of two disputing parties. Allah was hold, uh, it says, Allah sent a group of angels in the guise of two disputing parties. Dawood was holed up in his sanctuary, deeply engaged in worship. When these parties scaled the sanctuary's wall, their sudden appearance by way of such an odd entrance frightened Dawood. He wasn't expecting anyone. So they told him, don't be afraid. We are two disputing parties. One of us has transgressed against the other. So judge justly between us and, and guide us to the straight path. Still confused, Dawood, he said, okay, I will agree. So one of them said, pointing to the other, this is my brother. He has 99 sheep and I have only one. Yet he demanded, hand her over to me. And when he said this, he was overbearing in his address. Dawood, was, who was a sworn advocate of the oppressed, he was convinced by this man's complaint. So he hurried and said, your brother has wronged you by demanding that your sheep be added to his. Many among the masses wrong one another like this. Only those who believe and do goods are exempt. How Alas, how few they are. So no sooner had Dawood said this than he realized what he had just tested him, uh, that we had just tested him. 
and that he had failed to hear both sides of the dispute. He had been so eager to rescue this man from his brother's oppression and uh, convinced that his brother had acted wrongly, as most people do, that he failed to be impartial and fair in that uh, case. With deep regret, Dawood sought forgiveness from his Lord and bowed and uh, repented. <clears throat> he says, uh, let me see here. Further on. Because he realized his mistake and sought forgiveness, Allah forgave him his oversight and raised him to a high station. Allah told him, O Dawood, we hereby make you our vicegerent or Khalifa on the earth. So judge between people justly and do not follow your desires, or they will lead you away from Allah's path. And those who lose Allah's path shall suffer a severe punishment because they have forgotten the day of judgment. <clears throat> Let's see here. Okay. He says in the footnote, there's a connection between Dawood's mistake, his repentance, and Allah making him a vicegerent and hence judge. Allah, David's response or Dawood's response to his own mistake shows his own humility and willingness to submit to truth. This is the raw material needed for Allah to choose someone and fortify him with infallibility. There is clearly a strong parallel between this story and the story of Adam. In both cases, Allah created a scenario to teach each a crucial lesson under safe circumstances where the person could cause no real harm or break no real laws. So in this case, it is a tarqa awla, as we mentioned, choosing the less preferred method. The better preferred method would be to hear both sides of the story, but he heard one side of the story. So <clears throat> same was in the case we mentioned with Nabi Adam alayhi salam. So he says with this newly, with his newly gotten authority, Dawood set about judging cases and delivering justice, but he soon realized the limitations of his court. Every once in a while, it happened that he was sure of a person's guilt but he could not prosecute him because of a lack of incriminating evidence. So he knew that the person did it, but he didn't have the evidence to you know, convict him in the court of law. So he asked Allah to allow him to judge not based on evidence and the testimony of the witnesses, but based on Allah's divine knowledge. Allah told him, you have asked me for information of which I have never given to anyone and upon which it is not fitting for anyone to judge but me. Dawood insisted. So Allah sent Jibra'il to warn him once more. But when Dawood continued to insist, he told him, Allah has answered your request. The first case that will be presented to you tomorrow will be such a case. So the next morning, two men appeared before him, one old and other young. The young man had a bunch of grapes in his hand. The old man said, uh, Ya Nabi Allah. This young man came into my garden, destroyed my grape vines, and ate from my grapes without my permission. David asked the young man, what is your side of the story? He admitted that he had done whatever he was accused of. So Allah warned Dawood once again, if I reveal the true verdict in this case, and you pass your judgment accordingly between these two, your heart will not like it, and your people will not accept it. Dawood, the old man, broke into the young man's father's garden, killed him. He stole his garden and stole 40,000 silver pieces from him and buried it in a corner of the garden. Give the young man a sword and order him to execute the old man. Then turn the garden back over to him and tell him to dig in such and such a place and to recover his father's money. Dawood passed the judgment as Allah told him to. And there was an uproar, as you could believe, from Bani Israel. They said, how does he order the thief to kill and execute the victim? Because it appeared to be the opposite way. But that was not the reality. But Dawood is basing his judgment on the reality of Allah's knowledge, not what is apparent to people. So Dawood asked Allah to save him from this backlash of his people. So Allah informed him where the young man's father was buried. He told him to go there with the Bani Israel and to uh, bring him back to life and invoke him so that he could describe the circumstances of his death. 
So he did this and Bani Israel were satisfied. So Nabi Dawood salam, brought this man back to life in Allah. Uh, similarly, like Prophet Isa salam, is one of his miracles. So he came back to life. Also, Nabi Musa and many others have done this. He brought him back to life. And then he told the account of his uh, what happened. Bani Israel were now satisfied with this. Then Allah told Dawood, in the future, judge based on evidence and the testimony of witnesses and do not ask to pass judgment based on my knowledge until the day of judgment. Is this knowledge is hard for people to accept because they don't see and they don't understand the reality of what was happening be, behind the scenes. In another case, Dawood did not dare ask for Allah's secret knowledge of the truth, but he employed uh, interrogation methods to uncover the truth. So there was a woman and she complained that her husband had taken all his money and left to do business with a group of other men from their village. When the company returned, her husband was not there. When she asked about him, they simply said that he had died. She asked about his money, and they said they don't know anything about the money. Of course, they don't know. No one knows about that. So Dawood asked her, do you know these you know, men that journeyed with your husband? So she said, yeah, I know them. Uh, she said she did. He said, are they alive or dead? He asked. She said that they were alive. So he ordered all the men to be gathered together and interrogated. So he lined them up and asked them, do you think I don't know what you did to this woman's husband? So he then assigned one guard to each man and he ordered hoods to be put over each one of their heads. He sent each detainee with his guard to a separate corner of the court. With the detainees out of the earshot, they couldn't hear what he said. He whispered to the crowd that they had that had gathered there to watch this trial. He said, when I call out, Allah is great, you call out Allah is great. So when he says Allahu Akbar, the crowd says Allahu Akbar. So with everything set, he called the first detainee forward. He uncovered his head. He began interrogating him. And in a subdued voice, he says, on what day did you set out on your journey with this woman's husband? What month was it? Where did you reach when he died? What sickness did he die of? How many days was he sick? Who nursed him? On what day did he die? Who bathed him? Who gave him a ghusl? Who shrouded him? Who prayed for him? Where did you bury him? One by one, the man answered his questions, hesitating here and there. And when he was done, Dawood shouted out, Allahu Akbar. All those who were present there, they all said, Allahu Akbar. On hearing everyone shouting this, the rest of the men, they grew worried. They were, they thought that this person caved into Dawood's interrogation and uh, revealed their crime. So Dawood had the first man taken away. He brought the second man there. And in the same way, he did the same thing. This time he stared the frightened man in the face and he said, do you think I don't know what you did to this woman's husband? Without another thought, the man said, oh, prophet of Allah, it is true. I was a party to his murder, but I didn't want to kill him. So he admitted to it. One by one, Dawood brought all the men forth, and one by one, they each admitted to their role in the person's murder, in that man's murder. And he punished them, and he restored the lady with the wealth uh, that her husband had left and her family. So these are some of the judgments of Dawood. He says, although Dawood was a king, he lived humble life. He, however, uh, depend on the public treasury for his personal upkeep. So once Allah told him, Dawood, you would be a perfect servant to me if you only did not depend on the public treasury instead of earning uh, your own keep by working with your own hands. So Dawood wept for this, for having fallen short of Allah's expectations. So he decided to devote some time of each day to weaving strips of palm leaves into mats. And uh, he made these with his own hands. And then he would sell these and make a loaf of barley bread from the money that he earned from selling. On seeing Dawood make this effort, Allah told him that he would teach him the art of blacksmithing. 
which would be more profitable and more useful. So he taught him how to melt the iron to the consistency of like a warmed wax and shape that metal and how to make armor to protect them from the attacks of the enemies. So he told him, manufacture chain mail and be precise in linking the rings and do good things with these gifts for I see what you do. So he eventually developed his skills so that he could make a set of chain mail every day. And he sold these for 1,000 silver pieces each. And he became independent of the support of the public treasury. It's good for even this is for profit, and we're speaking of the prophet and the king also, but it's also good for a scholar to be financially independent also of community and be able to, for those, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> resident alam, for example, or any scholar, you know, in this way, he doesn't become a, a slave of the community and what they desire, for example. Uh, a lot of communities, unfortunately, I have seen, have tried to control the scholar who is in that position in their community. They usually hold something over their head and they control and limit the freedom of speech that that scholar has. And they say that, well, you need me. If I don't um, supply you or pay your salary, then you will be, you know, uh, what will you do? You don't have any other source of income or no sort of business, no sort of anything so you listen to what we say and you say only what we tell you or you don't mention topics that we don't like and we don't want you to talk about and so on and so forth but uh they limit the freedom of speech you know but the job of the scholar is to say what is true to say what is needed it's not to say what uh, people want to hear it's to say what people need to hear and the job of the scholar sometimes, most of the time, is to make people uncomfortable because when they are comfortable, they will never change and they will never work on themselves. But when you make someone feel uncomfortable, uh, that makes them change. I remember one time I was uh, in a community doing Muharram and I gave a lecture about death. And one of the people afterwards says, man, no one likes to talk about that. And no one, uh, you know, you're brave to go talk about these type of topics. And we don't, and a, lot, a lot of people want to hear about those things. And they're scared of those things. And I said, well, it's the job of the scholar to make, you know, not to say what the people want them to hear, but to say what the people need them to hear. People need to be reminded of these things. And they say, don't speak about such and such topics for example, or we'll take your visa away from you, for example, you'll be deported. Uh, I've seen this happen to other scholars, unfortunately. It's very unfortunate, and it could be avoided if the scholars had found a way, for example, to make a living and be independent, have some other source of income instead of depending solely on the community. So <clears throat> we have to, uh, we take this lesson from uh, Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, and we see that even a prophet of Allah uh, went and worked and did some sort of business and trade and sold chain mail to support himself instead of um, just solely relying on the public treasury to take care of him. And we witness this from the A'imma alayhi salam that they also worked and did things. It says Dawood was one of four prophets chosen to battle with the sword. During one of his battles, his general and close friend, Uriah, he fell. Uriah had been a faithful supporter to Dawood, uh, and Dawood wished to honor him in death. He personally delivered the news of his death to his wife, Bathsheba, is mentioned her name. And it says he saw that she took it badly. It was the custom among the Bani Israel that a widow would never remarry. So if her husband died, that was it for her. No other husband at all. After several months, when her mourning period was over, Allah commanded Dawood to go and seek her hand in marriage, precisely to break through his own deeds, uh, through his own deeds and actions you know, this uh, act that was wrong, that was celibacy in the culture of a widow. When a lady becomes a widow, she does not remarry. And we see that there is a clear uh, parallel to this story to 
Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to overcome the cultural prohibition against marrying one's adopted son's ex-wife, which he did by uh, marrying uh, Zainab bin Wahab. She had previously been married to Zaid ibn Haratha, his adopted son. So to break this, this uh, tradition, he, the Prophet married this lady, even though the people were opposed because that was their tradition, is also the case in Dawood uh, breaking the tradition that widows should not uh, remarry. He said, as he expected, the Bani Israel saw his proposal to this woman as an affront to their customs. They began spreading rumors that Dawood had purposely killed uh, Uriah and that he, so that he could marry his wife. And the author says these false rumors have survived to this day. The Bible, unfortunately, that we have today uh, tells a tale and accuses uh, Dawood of this. Accuses him of fornication, Audh Billah, and conspiracy to commit, commit murder, and all these other things. Uh, this is cleared by Quran, you know, is not uh, brought up, but in Bible that it, it is uh, very derogatory about many of the prophets, and the Quran has come and cleared many of these misconceptions up. So he says these defamatory tales existed in the time of Prophet Muhammad and the Imams, alayhi musalam the Jewish storytellers would tell them to, uh, to the Muslims, many who unthinkingly accepted them as a fact. According to one tradition, Imam Ali and Imam Sadiq salam, threatened to lash anyone who recounted such a story about Dawood salam, or any other prophet, these derogatory stories that were false. He says in their words, they threatened to strike the had or the punishment twice. Uh, presumably had in this context refers to the 80 lashes due to someone who falsely alleges uh, sexual misconduct. Despite the Imam's best, best efforts to eradicate this story, uh, we see that the Ahl sunnah have preserved this story and they narrate it. It comes from these uh, Israeli uh, narrations unfortunately. So <clears throat> this is false allegation against Nabi Dawood. Said nonetheless, Dawood did as Allah commanded him to do and establish the right of a widow being able to remarry. So I think we should uh, stop here because we only have two minutes left and uh, we'll pick up in the next week where uh, Dawood goes to perform Hajj. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajil farajahum.